Hi there, Dave Levine here. Thanks for joining me for episode 11 of the Sports Stories podcast. Last week, we heard from Sarah Symington, who had been to two Olympics, worked in the business world, and now was playing her part in developing the next England netball players and teams. My special guest today is Nathan Wood, who currently leads the specialist and international coach program for the England Wales Cricket Board. In my view, spending time with Nathan is never wasted time. He comes from a cricketing family as his father played for England. He played at Lancashire for a number of years and is also an ECB level four coach. And I believe one of his greatest assets is his ability to ask great questions and show genuine curiosity and interest. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Nathan Wood, a great friend and colleague of mine to the Sports Stories podcast. Welcome, Nathan. Thanks very much for being on the Sports Stories podcast. It's really great to have you with me. Like I've known you now for quite a few years or so. Probably what I think it's, I was trying to catch the other day, it's five or six years at least. 2014, and I think, Dave, yeah. 2014, was it? Wow. 2014 yeah. when we met. Um, and I really got a great sense from you through the journey and the time we've got to know you of your philosophy and the way you work. But also what's really intrigued me is your, your career background from when you were a cricketer right the way through to running your own business and also now working within a, a governing body. So I'm, I'm really excited for today just to unpick some of those aspects of your career um, and also unpick your philosophy a little bit and understand where you come from. So without me giving too much away, can you kick us off by giving us a, a bit of a sense of possibly your first memory of, of being involved in sport? Oh, crikey. OK. Um, well, hello, Dave. It's really nice to see you. Um, and it was 2014, and I know that because it was my 40th birthday, and we met two weeks after, I think. So, um, earliest memory in sport. Well, okay, so my my dad was a professional cricketer, um, a much better cricketer than than I. I need to uh, to highlight that. And and my mum didn't work, so cricket was basically everything that I knew. So. I would say that cricket formed nearly all my childhood memories, but one that particularly um, stands out is back in 1979, and I was and I was four, and I remember walking down uh, down a street with my mum, and we walked, we walked past the a news agents, and outside the news agents there was a um, a billboard with the uh, front page of the Manchester Evening News on it and on the uh, <laughs> Evening News there was a headline and the headline was that my dad had left Lancashire Cricket Club now you know uh, uh, Wood quits Lancashire and I can see it crystal clear and the reason why it was impactful because um, it was actually news to my dad <laughs> let alone let alone us and and the emotional impact that it had on my mum because I was only four or five looking at her and then looking back at this board was something that I'll never forget and actually I think that I think it's probably shaped my my views and some of my behaviours ever since so that would be my earliest memory of sport that, that that I can easily recall. Wow, brilliant. So back as, as early as being four, that was your earliest memory of sport. So now can you give us a bit of a sense from from there and for our listeners, your your journey through sport and your career kind of up to today. What what's what have you done and where have you worked? So as I alluded to before, cricket was everything actually it, in my household. So I I became a cricketer. Um, I went through the, the, the pathway from, well, from a performance perspective, I got on the pathway at Lancashire at 13. Um, and from 14, I started captaining the, the, the youth teams and I got into the, the Young England teams. And I think I represented uh, England at every age group from 14 up to, up to 19. And I signed at Lancashire when I was 18. Um, and I did that for eight years. So I was, I was at Lancs for, um, for eight years. And I guess 
looking back, it was a career that didn't fulfil my expectations and wants. Um, I view it as a as a disappointment. Um, but you know that maybe the conversation will go there. Maybe it, maybe it won't. But but from there, I I, I then um, I did a couple of things. But but I, I started a a very small business and that led to me running a, a series of small businesses over over the next 18 years all of which were based around coaching and people development and then for the last two years um quite unexpectedly i've i've been working for a national governing body i've been employed by by somebody uh, um, and it's a, a bigger surprise to me as it is to anyone um but that's that I, I, i've been working at the ecb and there I, I head up the the specialist and the international uh coach development programs go on then I, you you opened the door there a little bit about your your time at lancashire you mentioned that it was a, a, a disappointing time for you why why was that why did you see it as a disappointment well i didn't achieve what i i wanted to or thought i that I could, um, but but more importantly than that, it wasn't the experience that I kind of hoped for or or thought it would be, um, and so not just on the field I felt like I I didn't achieve what I wanted to, but it was the experience of being a professional sportsman that didn't match to my expectations and it's all expectation driven it's all you know and what kind of was thinking the, to the future what what was your expectations can you recall those what what do you think that environment and that experience should have been like so i i remember having a conversation very early on um with somebody who was a bit of a mentor to me um and they said you do realize it's going to be really difficult you carving out a uh, a career at Lancashire because just look at the competition ahead of you and they're relatively young and so, so so to give you a little bit of background I was an opening batsman and I was solely an opening batsman but at the time um, Lancashire's opening batters who were three or four years older than me were Mike Atherton the England captain and John Crawley England player and then you had Jason Gallion in the wings who went on to play for England and so on and so forth. So uh, the competition was steep. But, you know, as a youngster, I think you have, well, I had confidence in my ability to kind of override that. And perhaps my ignorance meant that I didn't actually uh, see the wisdom in that mentor, uh, mentor's advice. And so I just kind of presumed because I'd, I'd done okay in every level that I played at, you know, and I'd, I'd done okay uh, Young England, that, that would just carry on and uh, the, the, a, a door would open <laughs> and in I would walk and that would be, that would be it forevermore. You know, that was did, my plan. And it, and it did open though, didn't it, for a while? It took a long time. So I made my debut, so I signed at 18 <clears throat> and I think I made my debut at, 22 and I actually thought I was ready when I was about 19 maybe 20 I was doing pretty well in the second team I was scoring a lot of runs I remember uh, at that time David Lloyd David Bumble Lloyd was 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 the head coach at Lancashire and, he, and I remember him coming to me you're very close you're very close <laughs> if you get 100 in the next second team game you're playing well I scored 90 in that second team game and they didn't pit me <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't, and I didn't uh, play for um, another couple of years. But I, I, I feel I was ready uh, a bit before then. Um, so I felt, I, I just felt a little bit kind of behind the pace. <clears throat> it wasn't going on the trajectory that I that I thought. So you also mentioned then you 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 run a number of small businesses um, <clears throat> in in people development and coaching, and now working for a governing body. And you also had a, a kind of a wry smile when you said um, you were really surprised that you would end up in a governing body. Can you give us a sense of the 
the differences between the different environments and why you see this is quite an interesting step for you working in a governing body? Well, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a governing body. It's the fact that I'm, I'm employed. So when I first started working for myself, I, I um, had a meeting with my accountant. And the very first meeting I, uh, I said to him, he said, um, I said, he said, commiserations, uh, Nathan, because you've now become unemployable. <laughs> and I didn't really know what it meant. But as, as I went more into that self-employed route and <clears throat> working for myself, I understood exactly what he meant in so much as when you work for yourself, you have to make all the decisions. And you, but, you, but you also have a lot of freedom and you don't have anybody kind of micromanaging you. Um, and you create systems that work for you and not necessarily work for the organisation or other people. And so I did get to a stage where I thought, that's it. You know, I've been working for myself for five years, 10 years, whenever it was. Oh, I can't, I can't work for anybody else. So, um, so when this opportunity came, then uh, that surprised me, actually. And more, and more so my wife. <laughs> for me your career has had so many different experiences you know both working as a self-employed and being part of an employed environment you know you've worked in various different teams and throughout this the ups and downs have you come upon a, a quote or a saying or a, a success phrase that you have from the bit I do know of you you're a man that do like some quotes and you do use them so what, what would be your quote? Um. <laughs> well, this won't surprise you. I've got a couple, and 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 and, and I would say that these two um, they act as a a compass for me. Look to add value, not interference. So uh, I think this. I think it. I think it's it, it stemmed from two things. One, um, my early upbringing, particularly my dad's influence, who was who was very dominant and brash figure uh, and a fierce fierce competitor but he also used to consistently extol the virtues of being the strong silent type <laughs> now he wasn't silent <laughs> but it's but something in that registered registered with me and 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 so now the way that i operate as a coach or as a a team colleague or as a leader is that actually if it doesn't need to be said don't say it because uh, all i'm looking for is to is to um add that uh, that value to the the conversation and move it forward rather than just speaking for the sake of it um that also can be a hindrance by the way in certain situations i have found the the, the second quote that i've kind of uses a steer um is uh, i'm not my work and i'm not my past and if i break that down i'm not my work uh is all about kind of identity and i've got i've got into trouble in the past in identifying that that my worth is wrapped in my work and that's a dangerous situation and so that's something that I consciously try and uh, navigate through. And, and, and not my past is, um, I believe it's a limiting belief. So I, I remember hearing Muhammad Ali, who is a real uh, person who catches my eye. And he came out with a quote. Um, it was something like, if, if I was the same at 50 as I was at 30, then I would have wasted 20 years of my life. And for me, that was just perfect. It was nectar because actually there were plenty of people in my early life who said, uh, you know, uh, I am what I am and I'm not changing for anybody and all that kind of stuff. And actually, I think there's huge value in um, evolving as a person w w as you get more experiences. So they would be the two quotes that, that, steer me P powerful stuff Nate. 
really powerful and to move us on then into an area then of a, an experience that you've had real great success in your career or your life and and how was one of those quotes played out in it right this is this is not be, me being modest at all i don't i don't i don't think there's one specific i can't recall one specific wow moment you know it's more something that happens every day um that kind of just helps me to to make decisions yeah I, ego is something that we, me and you have talked a lot yeah. about and we all have ego and i have had have had an incredibly uh, uh large ego which i'm working very very hard to suppress but this is this is a that is a genuine answer you know it's i, I don't think there's a particularly you know uh, salient point to be made here in terms of an instance it's just it is a daily thing that helps me to navigate the world well, let me rephrase it to a sense of then um could you tell us a, a time when you've been really really pleased with something that's happened and that you're an outcome that you've had any time again this is going around the it's not going to okay, be specific no, but any time any any time so okay, so a context would be in a team meeting. You know, we've all been in team meetings. Um, people dominate the floor, uh, and that's fine. If I feel that I've said one thing in the session, I'm being pretty quiet for the rest of it. But actually, it has had some bearing in a positive way on the outcome. Job, job done. And even though in those you know, specific example, uh, not non-specific examples. Somebody might have said, "Oh, Nate, you're a bit quiet today." Mm -hmm. um, as long as I feel that you know, I've added some value somewhere. It for me, it's not, absolutely not about airtime. It's it's about you know just helping the cause to to move on. What would be your proudest moment then, Nate, so far throughout your career and life? That's a, yeah, that's a that's a that's a tough question, Dave. In in terms of sporting life, could be yeah. I can simplify really proud, I, something you're really proud of. I can simplify it in playing. Okay. Um, and that's stats based. You know, cricket is a very stats based game, yeah. and I got a sizable hundred. You know, against. Surrey at the Oval when they went on to win the championship and I thought I played okay there. So that would be a, a, a playing moment that I was proud of. Um, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure about, you know. Yeah. That, well, and and if, if we flip it then in terms of something that's um, one of your biggest challenges in your life and your career in sport what, what might they have been and and how might one of those quotes help you get out of that experience uh, well i well i mean I, apart from every time that i set foot on the pitch you know being a, <laughs> being a challenge um undoubtedly the biggest challenge for me was the transition from being a professional sports person to not being not being a professional sports person the quotes that i'm that i said before did not help me with that at all at the time because those are quotes that have guided me post a uh, professional playing uh, career um but that transition was difficult and that's not a, that's not a new story you know that, that that's repeated time and time again but it's not it's not necessarily that i missed the game um it's more that i suddenly didn't have a purpose you know i didn't know i didn't know what i could do yeah. but more importantly i didn't know what i wanted to do and and i found that lack of direction very scary mm -hmm. and as a professional sports person the one thing you do have is purpose and goal and you know where you're going yeah. and when you don't have that I think that's why I'm a lot of. I remember Ricky Hatton saying something that my dad said 20 years before, um, and and that was a sportsman has two deaths, a natural one 
and the one at the end of his sporting life. So this isn't, you know, this isn't revolutionary stuff, but it is, it is as it is, um, how it is. That, that was a tough moment. Uh, and can you recall a little bit of the time and, and how did you navigate your way through that? Just to give the, you know, our listeners a sense of, you know, how, did, how would they overcome challenges of that nature? Well, everyone's different. Um, time and lots of it. There were a couple of experiences that, that, that I encountered that helped me to figure out what I really didn't want to do. Okay. And that actually uh, is useful in this process. Um, and at that time, um, what I realised I, I, I didn't want was to work for somebody else. Um, and I can go into that if you want to, but, um, yeah, so what were, what were, what were one of those two experiences? Well, they were both, um, job related. So when I went, um, when I finished cricket, the good thing about being a sports person is that you, 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 you tend to have a, a decent network of people and, you know, contacts are really important in this world. And so a contact of mine um, had a sports uh, manufacturing business, uh, manufactured cricket equipment, hockey equipment, and other stuff, and um, asked you know, if I'd come and do some work there. And I, and I lasted for a year. And it was a... Uh, I, used to, I used to say it was an account management role, but it was a sales job. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to go and kind of go to to schools, posh schools, and kind of sell these wares and stuff. And I was absolutely terrible. I was terrible and petrified, petrified. So um, <clears throat> it didn't end well. I, I remember him kind of sitting me down and saying, uh, um, well, lad, uh, um, it's not going to be me, so it's going to be thee. You're sacked. <laughs> uh, um, and from that experience, I kind of, I realised that I, I struggled after work, after being a professional cricketer, struggled to work as a salesperson for somebody else. Now, say, selling, what I've subsequently realised, is important in everything that you do. But at that time, I thought it's, a, it's, a, it's something that I don't want to do ever again. And then the second experience was after that, I kind of was flicking through the newspapers and I just didn't know what I could, what I could do or wanted to do. And the only thing that was kind of coming out in the papers, because that's how you found a job in those days. It wasn't kind of uh, uh, through anything else, but it was like the back pages, was um, recruitment consultancy. <laughs> and I didn't even know what a recruitment consultant was at that time. I was 26, 27. And, uh, but, but I was captured by the, the, the headlines of the advertisements. And they were, we're looking for people with drive. Yeah, I've got that. Uh, determination, I've got that. Professionalism, I've got that. Um, if you've got those, you know, tenacity, come and work for us. And... And the on-target earnings were kind of similar to, you know, that of a sportsman. So I thought, that's, that's, that's it. And, uh, and I applied. And I, I got a, an interview with a company called Robert Half International. <laughs> and, and that was a hell of an experience. I went through like five interviews. And, um, and at the end of the process, they offered me the job. So I took my my then girlfriend who came, became my wife, Sarah, up to the Lake District to celebrate. And we're driving in on, uh, after a three hour drive to the Lake District, dro drove into the hotel, posh hotel. I splashed out a bit because I've got this job. And it was Friday at half past five. And I got a phone call and I took the call and it was Robert Half International who just offered me this job. And they said, um, I don't know how to say this to you, but we're going to have to retract the offer. And I just went off on that. I mean, I, I just I just couldn't handle it. So I told them kind of what I thought of their <laughs> of, <laughs> of how they went about things. And I spent the weekend walking the lakes, stomp, stomping through the lakes with my wife 20 yards behind me. 
figuring out what the hell do I want to do in my life? What can I do? And I came up with two things at the end of the weekend. Not to work for somebody else. So I've got control. And do something that I know a bit about. Well, I tried the first thing that I knew about cricket. And that hadn't panned out. And the second thing I knew a bit about being a cricketer was fitness. And so I used that as a platform to start my own business, which was a, a fitness, fitness company. So, so those things that uh, made me realise what I didn't want to do actually gave me a steer. Was, yeah. there, was there anything else within that, though, that, that helped you work out what you did want to do? You know, looking at it as a positive. So, you know, I'm beginning to hear a little bit about the fact that you, you, you knew a little bit about cricket and you knew um, a little bit about sports. So was that a steer of something positive that you was, were sort of steering towards doing? Or was there any other catalyst to help you work out, actually, this is what I want to do? Part of this process um, of, of, of figuring out what I wanted to do, what, what I didn't want to do, part of it was I didn't want anything to do with cricket. And this is odd, because from naught years old uh, to 26 or 27, when I finished playing professionally, that, that was my world. But I made that very clear decision at that, at that time, um, based on the fact that um, I'd had a pretty disappointing experience, but, but my, my dad had. You know, my dad finished when he was 43, which was a quite a you know, long career, and he'd done everything in the game that you probably wanted to. He'd, he'd been a professional, he'd been a county captain, he'd uh, play for England. He'd got a testimonial. Um, he'd won more ma man of the match medals than anybody in the history of the game until Graham Gooch beat. I mean, he'd done. He had a good career. Mm. And yet, when I was a young lad and seeing him finish, I saw how lost he was. Right. And so, coupled with my experiences, I suddenly started forming an opinion. Well, cricket's not the answer for me. You know, and so um, that clarity last actually really helped me at that time because it made me go, right, cricket's gone. And I didn't set foot in Old Trafford for 11 years after that. <laughs> I can be quite stubborn sometimes. <laughs> but, but, it, but it also gave me clarity that I don't want to do that. So it, it forced me into thinking about what do I want? And after that weekend of walking in the lakes, it was you know have some independence have some control and maybe do something around fitness and health because that was always an interest you know to me so th there was something there about actually the the what i don't want working that out was actually a catalyst to start leading you towards working out what you do want and actually there were some positive steps being taken then from what i'm hearing yeah and and i'm a great believer actually that um, just to say yes to everything when you're young, because not only will you experience things that you love doing, but you'll experience things that you really don't love doing. And that kind of filters things through. So it's a bit like, um, 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 I can never say this correctly, uh, analysis by paralysis. So you go to a shoot supermarket and you look at the shelves and you've got, you want, I don't know, shampoo. And there's 50 different varieties of shampoo, and you're like, <laughs> I'll just get that one because I've no idea what, the, you know. Um, actually, clarity, I think, is really important in, in both angles, in both uh, ends of the spectrum. And so, if you get that out of the way early, I think it gives you an advantage because you suddenly realize, well, I don't want to do that. So, yeah. I, won't, I won't do that again. But, you know. So it's, you're narrowing things down by the sounds of it, aren't you? Yeah. But, but, but you've got to give it a go in the first place. Yeah. And I don't think that anybody can tell you what you're going to like or not. I think you've just got to go through it. Right. And, um, and I think actually that's probably informed my coaching actually a bit or um, helping people develop is that they've got to experience it, the good and the bad, to get to know where they want to go. I think once you've got focus, 
I think that helps solve a lot of things. I think a lot of people don't actually know where they want to go, um, which was me for a long time. And just to pick up on a point about the role your father's played in your career and how you've watched what he went through and what, how you paralleled your story to his, I want to take us to a place um, around looking at the role of the, that a parent plays within sport and in the sporting context. I know that you're a parent yourself and your son plays cricket. What's your views of the role of parents within sport they're absolutely critical there's no doubt about it absolutely critical in terms of the impact that they will have on their child's relationship with sport um, so an example would be there's, there's 168 hours in the week and more than half of these will be spent at home probably you know in front of your parents which absolutely dwarfs the two or three hours that you'll get with a sports coach. And so the impact that a parent has on the, the, their child's relationship with, with sport is um, immense. Mm. Now, I think that every parent um, absolutely wants to do their best for their child. You know, that's a given. But I think... Um, I don't. I'm trying to phrase this uh, skillfully. Um, there's certain things that a parent can do that that actually can influence that relationship in a good way or a bad way. But what in, examples might you have there? Then? Well, I think in terms of their role, hmm. I think it becomes potentially difficult and dangerous. Although there are people who can do it, but on the whole, I would say that it it potentially can become difficult when a parent also becomes the main coach. Now, I will grant you this, that I am skewed by my experiences, but it's also, you know, other experiences that I've accumulated. So I, I think that I've got quite a rounded view on this because, because I was the child of a sporty parent who became my coach. I then became a professional sports person I then became a coach and then I became a, a, a coach developer and I'm also the parent of a child going through so I think I've got a fairly rounded view, view of this but it is only my my opinion but I think it can be dangerous when that when that parent assumes that coach uh, position because um, there's a danger of the of the child linking their performance with the self worth, and that's a very difficult um, area to to manage. And it's something that I actually can speak of from ex experience because my uh, self worth was definitely linked to my performance on the pitch in and, a negative and, way. I'd say. Yeah, and, and therefore your relationship with your parents entwined within that uh with my father not not my mom and my okay. mom didn't was you know was just very supportive my dad was supportive in his way yeah yeah but there was there were certain things that perhaps you know were a hindrance in his in his approach to to me to my relationship with with, with sports at that time yeah. and and given therefore that you know as a as a rule parents are there to to really support and, and want the best for their child in sport um, with your vast experience through all those different positions that you've held what guidance or advice could you give to them what could they do to try and ensure that what they do is the best for their children um, I think this is pretty simple support them and to tell them how much they enjoy watching them play and that's it and when you say support them what does that look like so that would be logistics, um, giving them the opportunity to play, you know, if they want to. So, you know, to get good at something, you have to do something. And to do something, you have to be given the opportunity to do it. And when you're a young person, that opportunity comes from your parents. So there's a sacrifice in terms of what parents have to do because they might have to give up the Saturday morning lying to drive uh, their child 
sometimes a long way to the sporting venue and then watch them for, I don't know, an hour, two hours, three hours, six hours, however long the sport is, and then drive them back and then take them to training and buy the equipment. So as much as you can, you know, provide the resources for the, the opportunity for the child. Um, but I think it's really important that, that the child has the belief that when the parent is there watching them, they're not watching them through a critical coaching eye. It's from a, you know, you're my son and I just loved watching you play today. And I know you lost 10 nil, but hey, <laughs> I thought that pass was fantastic or whatever, you know. Yeah. If, if I flip the question a little bit as well, and given again that we, we as parents uh, are trying to really support and encourage the development of our children, from your experiences again, and your involvement in the game for so long and the role that you play, is there any one thing you would say to parents to generally stop doing that you see a lot of? Uh, well, I would say criticism. And I know that the counter argument is, but it's constructive. But when it comes from the parent, it's different from coming from a coach. Because one, it's such an intimate relationship that it impacts you much more greatly. But two, you can't escape it. So if a coach says to you, um, Dave, I don't think your performance was that good today because of this, then you can take that on board. It might hurt at the time, but you can go away from it and you've got the space to reflect on it. But when your dad or your mum says that, you know, you're going to be seeing them for the rest of the evening or the day over dinner and all that kind of stuff. And it's there. And I think, I think that dynamic changes things greatly. I really do. Um, so I think you've got to be, you know, I'm not saying for one moment that you can't be a parent and a coach of a player, but you've got to be really skillful with it. And you've got to understand um, what the need and want of the child is because that will often be different to your need and want. So when, you, when the child has a bad game and they've already been lambasted by the coach, the last thing they probably want is to get in the car and then have another kind of constructive, uh, critical talk from their nearest and dearest. What they want is just to probably get away from it or let it absorb and deal with it with their own time. Um, can I tell you, can I indulge you in a, in a story that kind of, of reflects? Can. I'd love to hear it, yeah. So it's, it's a collection of stories I'm going to uh, amalgamate into one. I got to a situation uh, where if I'd, if, I'd, if I'd done well on the sports field, cricket, um, didn't matter about football, which I, which I probably loved more than cricket, actually, when I was a youngster, but... Uh, if I played well on the cricket pitch uh, and my mum and dad weren't there, then I would uh, come home and I'd skip home. I'd skip home. and I couldn't wait to get home because I knew that the first question would be, after not seeing them all day, um, I've been at school you know, since nine o'clock, eight o'clock, I knew that the first question would be, how did you do at cricket? And I couldn't wait to tell them. And when I say on the rare occasions I've got 100 today, you know, they, I could see the pride coming through the face, you know, that's fantastic, you know, and it's just purring, you know, I loved it. At the other end of the spectrum, if I'd not done well, then I wanted to kind of slow that journey home, <laughs> you know. I wanted to prolong it because I knew that that question would come again. How did you do? And if I told them the truth, I could see it in their eyes. I could see it in their body language, how disappointed they were because they, they were probably disappointed for me. And it was all good intention stuff, but I could see their disappointment, which reinforced. Um, my point is, is that no matter if I did well or if I didn't do well, their reaction reinforced my standing in the family or my self-belief or my, my self-worth in that environment and i think that actually as a, as a young person 
when you go home, all you need, all you want and need is to know that it's just a supportive environment where you're not being judged. Safe place, yeah. A safe place. And I think that children are very resilient and they are resilient enough to say, to take the criticism of somebody in a different environment, knowing that they can go back to the safety of the home and escape from it. But when they feel that that criticism is coming from the, the home place, I think that is a different ball game. That's my experience anyway. It shaped my thinking. Oh, Nathan, really powerful uh, and thought provoking stuff there for parents because again you know we're all involved in our children's lives in many ways we're encouraging them to be active and you know there's so much in and around the sport environment talking about competition and enjoyment and fun and being involved in it and I, I think one of the things that gets really close to me is that is the power of sport in the way that we grow up and the way that we develop as individuals and people and so you you play a really important message for me there in terms of actually being conscious about the the real positive impact the parent can bring towards a child's life but just very very um, very subtly if not played out too well can actually be um, quite damaging or quite hurtful so it's a it's a real fine balance which I know is not easy to do but I know that we've also had conversations about this in the past and the importance of of this aspect in in creating a future for somebody whether it be at school or whether it be a, in a sports club whether it be professional or even at grassroots um, so I really want to thank you there for your, your kind of openness and honesty. I just want to take us then to, towards um, another bit of advice, you know, and I know you're giving advice very humbly from your experience. What would you say to somebody who would want to follow the career that you've taken? What advice might you give to them? Oh, cracky. Um, I guess it's the same advice that I'd give to anybody in any sector of society and that would be just to go for it and um say yes to any opportunity so I, I, and regardless of how much you know it scares you or you think you can't do it and i'm not saying that i've taken that advice by the way <laughs> this is the advice that i'm giving but um essentially take the chance and figure it out how to do it after that that would be my advice. You know, if you want something, go for it and then figure it out. Um, and I've not lived by that, by the way. But, you know, as a 45 year old, that, that would be, you know, the advice I would give somebody younger than myself. Have you, have you truly not lived by it? Or, or would you say there is times in your career, in your life where you've had to give it a go and work out afterwards? I've got better at it. And I think I've got better at it post cricket. Um, What's helped you get better at it? Self exploration. So, the, you know the one of the one of the benefits, I think, of having a uh, of, be, of being brought up in a family that is cricket dominated, is that. If cricket's not on the agenda, um, then there's not that much advice forthcoming. <laughs> and, and because there's not that much advice forthcoming, then it forces you to figure it out yourself. And, uh, you know, a lot of coaches talk about creating independent thinkers, don't they? And giving them the space to figure it out. It's exactly the same here. that you know, up to 26, when I was a professional cricketer, I had lots of advice uh, from my nearest and dearest and from lots of other people. But after that, um, because my network was solely cricket, really, that I had no advice from everybody, so I had to figure it out myself. And so um, I think that helped me kind of explore my myself a bit more than I've, I've done previously wow so you, you you leave me there with the thought about figuring it out for yourself um it leads me beautifully into into the next few questions which i'd like to ask and i'm going to go to what i term quick fire round here 
And my first question is going to be um, around a number of books, and I'm sure that there's been an element of reading that's taken place in articles because I know that you're a, you know, a person that explores their own development and purpose, and it's always keen to learn. So I'm going to fire some questions at you. What I want is yeah, a, a quick gut reaction, quick fire back. Okay, so um, what would you say the th sort of three or four books that you would recommend that have really uh, impacted on you in terms of your uh, your development and also that's inspired you along the way? Uh, okay, so the, fir the first book that springs to mind is a book. It was probably the first book that I read around sports psychology and the power of the mind. And that was um, Golf is Not a Game of Perfect by, uh, I think it was Dr. Bob Rotella. And I don't even like golf. <laughs> well, I don't, I, no, I, no, I don't dislike golf. I don't play it. You know, I yeah. play it very badly. The half a dozen games, you know. Um, but I found that absolutely fascinating. He talked about uh, training mindset and performance mindset. And I'd never even kind of thought about that before. So uh, that was a book that certainly sh that, that got me intrigued uh, from, a, from a young age as a coach. Um, so I thoroughly recommend uh, reading that uh, uh, for, for anybody reading that, if, if, if they're kind of setting off on their coaching journey. Anything by uh, Sir Ken Robinson. So uh, one particular one might be The Element, um, which is a book about the importance of creating environments uh, uh, which uh, cultivate creativity and innovation. And he's done a series of TED Talks, which are only 20 minutes long. But honestly, I think, I think actually one of his TED Talks is the highest grossing TED Talk of all time. He is fantastic. Well, I think he's fantastic. So uh, anything by Ken Robinson. Um, okay, and there's two more. Uh, I can't remember who wrote it, but it was Ego is the Enemy. Um, uh, it was um, the book basically argued that our biggest problems aren't caused by external factors, but from our own attitude and self-absorption. Um, Ryan Holiday, Holiday, I think, wrote that, and that that was um, that was again a, a game changer for me because it kind of clarified things in my mind around ego about being a sports performer and about being a coach and a people developer um and i don't want to go into too much detail um but yeah it, it clarified things there that helped me with that relationship with ego and then the last one would be a funny title why zebras don't get ulcers i can't remember who wrote it, it was it it's an old book but it, it kind of explains the triggers of stress and and how we can best cope with uh, stress and, and anxiety. Great, some really good books there for our listeners to go and try and dig into, so thanks for that. Most useful piece of technology or software that you've used within your career that's really helped you? Well, this is a, this is a really boring, unimaginative answer, but um, undoubtedly the, uh, the smartphone, the iPhone, um, for listening to uh, podcasts and, and audio books, you know, I find that so useful because because of the nature of of my role now in terms of travelling, although not now. Um, but I can get in the car and you know have a six hour round trip, and, and I can get through a book, you know, just kind of driving to and from a destination. So uh, for that reason only definitely uh the most important piece of tech um a, a slight tangent I, I, I downloaded a brilliant app the other day um yeah. it was about uh <laughs> it's nothing to do with sport but i think it helps go on yeah i think it, i think it helps people you know in the sporting world um i can't remember, I, I can't remember what the app's called it's about stargazing um what right. it called uh, star trek i don't know it's it helps you basically to kind of um identify all the celestial 
bodies up there and it kind of uh, augments it and all that kind of stuff. I'll tell, tell you what, we can make a promise. We'll dig out the name of it and then we can put it on the show notes okay. of, of the podcast. Yeah. But, but on a serious point, I think that, you know, gazing up there um, yeah. at the night sky or the day sky actually is, is actually one of the most beneficial activities that a human could do, particularly if you are in an environment uh, that is uh, a performance environment or something that creates stress, anxiety, um, which is probably you know, most of our lives. But I think it's fantastic for slowing you down, giving you perspective, um, brings you back to the now. Which leads me on to my, ne my next question, which would be, how do you physically or mentally prepare yourself to be the best you can be? Well, any kind of, any, any kind of activity that brings me back to the present. Um, so an, a, an example would be walking my dog, George, a, a very energetic working Cocker Spaniel. Um, you know, anything that, that, that connects me to right now as opposed to thinking back or looking forward um and i think and i particularly enjoy walking a dog because i think we've got so much to learn from dogs and also all kind of animals because because they do live in the moment you know they absolutely live in the moment and uh, and that's actually that, that book that i talked about before why why zebras don't get ulcers they don't get ulcers because they do live in the moment and i don't worry about you know what's coming uh what's coming in you know in the future they they see the lion now to deal with it and then they go back to you know chewing the grass so a lot to learn from dog walking I would dog say. walking or zebras <laughs> <laughs> or, or zebra walking yeah yeah um okay last couple of questions then if you won the lottery tomorrow what would you spend the money on well my mum and my mother-in-law are both currently suffering from dementia so um it would be something connected to that uh, truly dreadful disease and go on then the, the last one in, in one sentence what advice would you give to your teenage self well there's a bit <laughs> there's quite a lot of stuff Dave uh, oh crikey um, okay so uh, to focus less on to focus less on my internal state and to allow myself to just enjoy enjoy stuff more and particularly enjoy playing the game because you know that is all it is it is just a game it's nothing more nothing less it's just a game and so yeah um yeah don't focus too much on what's going on in here uh kind of what what do they say um smell the roses or whatever you know, <laughs> kind of yeah experience the external world a lot more okay and and just to wrap us up and this is always a very difficult one and i appreciate this but would you be able to identify or name a person that's been the most influential person on your career to date other than your father in terms of your role in sport just one okay if there's more that's good um well, the reason why I say I ask you that is because I, I see my career as like being a player and being a non-player. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, um, as a player, yeah. it would be uh, Dav Watmore, who was the Lancashire head coach uh, for a period of time. Great. He was a, I think he was the first outsider to to come into the club. He just won the World Cup, actually, with Sri Lanka. Yeah. And he came in as an outsider. And actually, I, I'm not sure how others got on with him, but I know that, um, that, I, that I certainly uh, wanted to uh, do well for him. And, uh, and I genuinely believe that he was the... He was probably the only coach at Lancashire to have genuinely believed in me, and that gave me belief. And it's, I don't think it's a, a coincidence that I play my best, you know, under him as opposed to others. So he would be one uh, that was an influence because he brought fresh thinking into the club. Um, post career, 
um, there's three, but I won't go. I'll tell you what. An easy. Uh, your first guest on this uh, on this podcast series, Lordy Gordon Lord. So um, when I was going through my level four, he um, he was the head of elite coach development at the ECB, and his wisdom and uh, relational skill was was a real eye opener for me, and it was a it it made me realise that, uh, that that there's more more than one way to uh, to coach people, and and it wasn't necessarily the I'm in charge, I'm the boss, I've got all the uh, knowledge, and here it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, he was. Uh, a very big influence. It's so much of an influence, and he'll laugh now. So much of an influence. I went out and bought a couple of tweed jackets. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Which I still wear today <laughs> when it's winter. But uh, yeah, Lordy was a, a, a massively impactful uh, person. But there's so there's, there are others. There are. But yeah. Okay, and my very, very final question then would be, you've given the time today and it's been a fascinating sort of journey through part of your career and your world and I'm sure we could talk for days longer because there's, there's so much to unpick and your, your, your depth of understanding, your insight and your honesty is just a, a breath of fresh air for me. Um, but in terms of somebody else, whose life story or sports story would you really enjoy listening to or be really curious about? This is a very easy one for me. But uh, it's also a uh, uh, a common one. Um, but it's uh, it's the great Muhammad Ali, and um, obviously we've heard lots of things about his life from others. Um, but I really would cherish the opportunity to have been able to listen to his life in his words um, for you know so many factors. You know he transcended sport. His sport, well, all sport actually. Um, it was the, it was the greatest, but was still prepared to walk away at the height of his powers from his sport, which I don't think many people would, you know, would have the courage and the confidence to do, and um, and because he's the most charismatic sportsman, the sports person the world has ever seen, bar none without question so um maybe a cheesy one but for me you know, that, that, you know that would be the person that speaks to well i guess what a great person to kind of draw our podcast to a to a close with so nathan i, I would just like to really thank you yet again for being so open and honest in your usual natural insightful style and um, you know if people would be interested to to follow your journey a bit further can you tell them a little bit about what, what are you up to at the moment, uh, how they might be able to follow you if there are any contact details? Very happy to speak to anybody out there um, because it's what I love doing. and I love talking and finding out about others. I'm far more comfortable actually about uh, listening to others than talking about myself. Um, how, how do people contact me? Um, I'm on all the social media channels. It's either Nathan Wood or Nathan Theo Wood. Um, and I've got a website, um, which is, and I've not, I'm not, I'm not seen it for a while, actually, since I've been working at the ECB. So I'm trying to recall the, the website address. It's uh, nathanwood.consulting. Um, so yeah, all my kind of email details are on there. So I'm more than happy to speak to any of you your listeners and uh, hear, and hear their stories which is fascinating great well thank you again and i want to just wrap it all up here by saying you know it's been a pleasure to hear that you know the nathan wood story in the nathan woods words you know in the in the terms of what you said about muhammad ali and listening to his story through his words you know and i'm sure we could hear so much more you know of yours in time so i'd lo love to have you back on the sports stories podcast again in the future to talk about some of the other areas that you're involved in but just as such as of today um thanks again for all your your honesty your openness you know I, I know this is sometimes as you say not easy for you talking about yourself and sharing parts of you but uh, it's come across as really very very natural and i really enjoyed listening to you and as i say i could keep going 
and, and hearing a great deal more because I've certainly lo learned a lot about you given that I already know you very well. So Nathan, thanks very, very much. Um, and just to the listeners out there, if, you, if you're looking to listen to any more of, of stories similar to Nathan's, then please do subscribe to the Sports Stories podcast. Um, we're on all the other social media platforms. Um, and um, what, what I will offer at some stage is some of my reflective thoughts about the, the podcast as of today. So Nathan, thanks a lot. Everybody keep listening in and take care. Bye for now. Thanks, Dave. Well, I found that a really intriguing and insightful discussion with Nathan. There were so many great points to take away. The three key themes that stuck with me were his relationship with his father and the expectations he held and how this shaped his cricket and life experiences. His insight into his identity and self-worth and the mantra he now holds. I'm not my work and I'm not my past. I just love that. And lastly, I got a great sense of his continual desire to learn and learn about himself. He uses the term self-exploration, which I think was a key in making him the person he has become. So with this in mind, I'd like to pose a couple of questions for you to consider. What is the first question you ask your children or grandchildren after they have played sport? And what impact does this have? And what could you do more of or differently to positively impact on the sport experiences of those around you? You'll know by now that I love asking questions as I really believe that this is the way to increase your self-awareness and in turn really helps you become a happier person and have a, and live a more fulfilling life. It would be great to hear how the questions I pose resonate and impact on you. I'm also keen to get your broader feedback on the podcast series. So please drop me a line at sportstories247 at gmail.com. What other ways of connecting with me as well as picking up the key messages from today's conversation are in the show notes. One last request I have please also take the time to leave a really quick review on Apple Podcasts as this really helps new listeners engage and come on the Sports Stories journey with us. Also sharing and subscribing on different platforms is also hugely appreciated and very, very useful. Now, all it leaves me to say is a big thanks again to today's guest, Nathan Wood. I do also hope you have taken at least something small from your listen and I really do look forward to having you with me, Dave Levine, again, next week on the Sports Stories podcast. Have a great week.